Yes, I know I'm wearing an England rugby hoodie. It's the it's the Rugby World Cup, so I've got to support the land somehow. Pushing the boat out. It's something Hollywood executives know incredibly well. It's something I've had to do quite a bit over cinema's long and storied history. From the earliest films in the late 1890s, there's always been a need to deliver technological innovation, not just for the industry, but to customers as well, purely in an attempt to artificially inflate the ticket price a little bit more. But one technology has had a patchier history than most, and no, not just because it's evolved so much over the last 50 years. It's more because of the audience uptake on it. So, this episode on the journal, we're going to have a deep dive into that technology and how it's evolved and, in some cases, changed audiences' perceptions over the years. So, we've got in mind, I'm Jack from eJackSmith.com. Welcome to the journal, and this episode, we're going to have a good look at the rise and fall of 3D. Now, a little bit of history of the format. Stereoscopy has been a thing since the late 1890s, and it was a Brit who invented it. Oh, the pride of having one of our own invent a fantastic piece of film kit. William Free Screen was the man who filed the patent for that 3D film process. And that process was simple two films projected side by side on a screen and the viewer looked look, look through a device called a stereoscope to converge the two images to create one main polarised thing. Now if you're wondering why that sounds very familiar, the format and the technology hasn't really changed that much. The principles have remained the same since that 1890s pattern. And the stereoscope? Well that's evolved a fair bit. It was a big device back then when it became paper glasses in the 50s, and then your glorious sunglasses from the late 2000s onwards. And this is before we talk about IMAX. We'll get to that. It all began, on a mainstream level at least, with the release of House of Wax. This was arguably the first big mainstream 3D film to be released. And of course, it attracted a lot of attention. House of Wax was also pioneering because at the time, a lot of American audiences hadn't experienced cinema with the newly developed stereophonic sound. A technology that we've kind of come to live by nowadays. You're literally hearing the journal in stereo right now. Although I can hear this in 5.1 if I really wanted to. Berg's having an amplifier in the studio. House of Wax was the first mainstream sound picture that went to America to a lot of American cinemas, and audiences were quite taken back by the format. No, not 3D, the sound. It even attracted the attention of uh, one Alfred Hitchcock. He would uh, go on to make Dial N for Murder in 3D. I've actually seen a bit of the 3D print of that, not an actual 35 mil print. I've seen a bit of the Blu-ray remaster many years ago at college. AP hey, Jackson. Um, but I've seen a bit of Dial M for Murder 3D, and back then, in the 50s, it was all about making things stick out of the camera, because they knew it'd work. They knew it would be effective. But it made audiences sick. Back then, you didn't have your fancy stereoscopic polarised glasses, you had your old school anaglyph red-blue glasses, and... as someone who has to wear a pair of these all the time, they do not feel nice, they annoy your eyes after a while, and that really did put audiences off after two plus hours of having to watch a film. And on top of that, this is before this is well before digital projection was a thing. So the quality of the image on screen all depended on how nice the copy of the print of the film you were showing. This is why projectionists are so damn important. Because you don't want to put a bad quality film out on screen. No, you don't want a dirty print either. I might be a customer, but I do know my stuff about projection. But 3D, early forms of 3D at least, made people incredibly sick. And then in the 60s, it just died. It just, there was no main 3D prints. And then Jaws 3D came along. <laughs> Jaws 3D, what a stupid gimmick. It's almost like Jaws 4D could be a thing nowadays, because what Cineworld have been doing. Surprised we didn't get that prophecy from Back to the Future 2 fulfilled. Was it Jaws 19 or something like that? But Jaws 3D happened in an attempt to get audience traction back onto the format and 
It did work somehow, but the same issues were prevalent. Audiences were still getting sick. Not even the presence of an established brand like Jaws could make the film a commercial success. It was done just to capitalise on the format, just because Universal wanted to say, look, we want to make a film in 3D, but we don't really want to put too much into it. And yes, we might have mentioned Jaws 3D, but there were a few other major 3D films in the 80s in the sort of repopularization of the format. Friday the 13th Part 3 in 1982, which was also the year that uh, a certain British television channel that backs a lot of films launched. Yeah, Channel 4 launched in 82. We know our stuff about TV too. I mean, I did a degree in film media, popular culture. What do you expect? But it was also joined by I'm a Seville 3D in 1983. These films were just doing it for the gimmick. They used the whole, we'll just stick something out of the screen trick, which never works unless you make it a kid's film. To see Hollywood use 3D just for box office gain kind of set the tone for 3D in that decade. And it's a shame because you can be very bold and very original with the format. The final nail in the coffin in this resurgence of the format at the time was a huge flop called Space Hunter Adventures in the Forbidden Zone. And according to one of the sources I've researched this, it actually failed to turn a profit and they abandoned the technology not long after that. Kind of tells you everything about how audience perceive 3D Namely, as a little thing called home video was coming along. 3D in the 90s was a mainstay, and it was more used for gimmicks. Just look at something like 1991, for example. If you've been to a Disney park, you'll be familiar with this. Jim Henson's Muppet Vision 3D. Fantastic experience, because it's the Muppets. Come on. But there were also a lot of other releases, including T2 3D, Basque Across Time, T-Rex Back to the Cretaceous, Encounter in the Third Dimension from 1919. Hang on. Hang on one minute. That director's name looks familiar. Ben Stassen? Oh god. Oh my god. Somehow this film got a PG certificate from the BBFC. Alright then, Mitzi. Grab some puppy. Alright then. What the f That's a callback to episode two if you ever you saw one. But the first main IMAX animated film was Cyberworld. Originally shown in IMAX and IMAX in 3D, and it was converted. A lot of it was converted from 2D to 3D. Intel were the main commercial partner behind this. But after Cyberworld came out, filmmakers were a little bit more daring with the format. IMAX's mainstream commercial appeal was solidified when Warner Brothers reissued The Matrix using the IMAX proprietary DMR process. This is the first mainstream multiplex film to get a premium large format release. And I've been dying to kind of do an episode on those words. We might merge it into this one if we're running low on time. If it wasn't for the success of The Matrix and 2004's 3D release, of the Polar Express, IMAX wouldn't have the commercial dominance that it has on a premium large format market that it does to this day. And then Christopher Nolan happened. But all of that was 2D. We're talking about 3D today. But we're going to fast forward to the 2000s now. And this is really where 3D gets interesting. In late 2005, a company called Real D uh, set, started setting up shop at a few cinemas up and down America and a couple over here, including the, uh, the iconic View West End, a uh, cinema which I, I might have a bit of experience with. But they set up shop in a few cinemas around the world in an attempt to sort of test not only DLP digital projection, which was the earliest form of digital cinema, yes, it took the industry about seven years to go fully digital, began back in 2005, believe it or not. But they installed a few 3D screens up and down the world for the release of Disney's Chicken Little. This was the first big digital 3D release of an animated film. And sure, while Robert Rodriguez's Spy Kids Free Game Over came out in 2003, released on a 35mm print with 3D glasses, I have a copy of it on DVD with the, in, in 3D. Shame the film had to be crap. But Chicken Little was the first big 3D release 
in this current form of 3D that we know and love. That went down incredibly well. So over the next couple of years, more cinemas had this real D technology installed and audiences got more and more accustomed to polarized 3D technology, which is a lot easier on the eye. They legitimately feel like sunglasses. They don't make you sick. And unlike other forms of 3D, you can put them on top of other glasses and you still get a good effect, but you do look pretty damn silly as a result. Never did buy that pair of clip-on glasses, did I? Not long after the premiere of Chicken Little in the real D format, a lot of other manufacturers wanted in on the game. Dolby launched their own proprietary system in 2006 in time for the release of Open Season and The Ant Bully. I've seen one of those films when I was a lot younger and in all honesty, Open Season was crap. Expandy 3D, which has provided a good technology for a lot of 3D televisions when they were the fad back in the day, launched their system in time for the release of Monster House and, oh yeah, the reissue of The Nightmare Before Christmas. Again, Monster House was a pretty crap film, although it was entirely motion captured. That's a little honour, that's a nice hot and fresh science fact for you all. In 2008, Event Cinema began using 3D and... Love them or hate them, you two know how to make money when they see it. You 2 3D was released. It was the very first live action digital 3D film. The cameras had developed to a point where they could shoot native 3D. Bear in mind, this was a year before Avatar came out. And only you 2 could make a live action 3D film. This was followed up by Hannah Montana, the best of both worlds. I never thought I'd ever end up talking about Miley Cyrus on a journal. But in more credible films, 2008 was dominated by two major 3D releases, Journey to the Centre of the Earth and Disney Animation's Bolt. But as Real D were making these advances in terms of polarised 3D, i.e. putting a filter in front of a projector, synchronising it with a film and doing what they call triple flash, one left eye goes on screen, right eye goes on screen, left eye goes on screen, right eye goes on screen. As all this was going on, James Cameron was hard at work on what would be the magnum opus for the format. It took him a hell of a long time to get it made, but as Real D were getting their traction going, he was indeed working on Avatar using that Fusion 3D camera system. Now, what a lot of these films in the digital age don't do well is the fact that they are converted in post-production to 3D, which doesn't necessarily warrant as good of a stereoscopic result as a full-on filmed and made in 3D film. But as Cameron was working on Avatar, he knew that 3D would be the big thing. And so did Jeffrey Katzenberg of DreamWorks Animation. He infamously said in 2005, and this, this is a quote that if you did film studies at Newman, my college of choice, if you did film studies at Newman back in the day, this quote will be embedded in your brain after all these years. Jeffrey Katzenberg in 2005 said words to live by, you can't camcord a 3D. Yes, 3D was seen by Hollywood as a solution to piracy. <laughs> oh God. But Avatar came out in 2009 and it broke every record imaginable. Not only did it get released in Real D, 2D, IMAX, Sony premium large format screens, but it defined what the genre could do. So many cinemas had their 3D screens put in. In fact, my beloved View Press, they had their 3D screen installed for Avatar back in December 2009. It was their second digital projector that they'd had installed. Screen 5 had had it done the year before, but Screen 6 went 3D and it was 3D for 10 years. But more on that in a bit. Now, earlier on we mentioned IMAX. The reason we waited until now to mention it is because it only really came into prominence in the 80s and the 90s, especially the 2000s. What IMAX is, is 3D for giants. Original IMAX screens use 70 millimeter film flipped on its side to enhance the image have two of those projectors side by side 
and you've arguably got some of the biggest projection systems around. I got to see into the projection room at the IMAX in Bradford once and I was a dwarf compared to an IMAX film print. Now because of the IMAX film being a little bit bigger than usual they can't actually attach the soundtrack. That comes on a separate hard drive. We are going into proper nerdy detail once again. So bear with us. IMAX film prints don't actually have the soundtrack attached to them. Because the image is flipped on its side, there's more room for the actual film itself to be projected from. That's why the screens are that big. So the soundtrack comes on a separate hard drive. However, since the industry went digital in 2012, IMAXs have got a fair bit smaller. It's only recently that we're getting to see IMAX with laser systems reinstate that traditional 143 aspect ratio. That's the square, as a lot of you old school people will call it. This has added people to sort of create the term LIMAX for the digital cinemas that were using the IMAX name. And I just happen to live an hour away from a proper old school IMAX. And it's the only one this side of the north to have the old school screen with the new school projectors. And as for 3D prints in IMAX, well, the basics are, ba are pretty much there. Two prints side by side, one left eye, one right eye. Both images pass through a polarised filter, which is then picked up by the glasses in the screen to give you that lovely crisp 3D effect. After Avatar came out, 3D was the big thing in cinema. Everyone wanted a piece of the pie, so they just started converting films to 3D for the hell of making films in 3D. Digital 3D isn't without its faults though. Again, we're going to go into nerdy projection detail here, bear with us. The way these 3D systems work, use that polarising lens literally right in front of the projector. That means any image that passes through it, any light that passes through it, gets bumped down by about 30%, which is difficult when you can't actually remove the polarising filter in question. Odin have figured out a way to do it by putting their Z screens, as they are officially called, on these retractable mounts that automatically move in and out of position when they're needed. However, if your multiplex has the Sony 4K projectors installed, oh boy, you've, you've got a long run ahead of you. It's easy to tell whether a screen's fitted for 3D or not. Just look very closely. If the image on a 2D film looks a little blurred, just look to the projection room. And if there are two images coming out of that window, it's a 3D projector. This has been a bugbear for me since I've started getting properly into the exhibition business. And this July, well, they changed a few things at my local view. After 10 years of having their biggest screen be set up for 3D, in fact, they've got, they had two 3D screens. Five and six were running 3D after they had Sony projectors installed in 2011. But in July of this year, after 10 years of running 3D films, head office decided it was time to convert screen six back to just regular 2D showings. But it start, slowly started to die off after 2012 happened. Filmmakers weren't as confident using the equipment. Filmmakers weren't as confident doubling their budget to include 3D post-conversion because you've got to take 2D visual effects, you've got to take 2D uh, raw footage, convert them to stereoscopic imagery. And that is not cheap. That adds at least a hundred million dollars onto your budget because the technology, technology is still a work in progress. But it's only the animated films that have really got traction in 3D. And another thing that the multiplex operators really started to do, especially mid 2011, mid 2012, is they started charging premium prices for it. And they also started charging for the glasses, which is kind of nice because you get to keep them. Although people did keep them instead of putting them in those silly little bins they had outside the screens. The format has become a lot more experimental of late though, especially with French New Wave filmmaker Jean-Luc Godard, directed films like Breathless, or if you're French, A Bout de Souf, and of course Le Mepri, using the format to be a little bit more inventive. 
He created two films for that. An anthology film, 3x3D, where he directed one segment, as well as 2014's Goodbye to Language, a film so strange the subtitles weren't even on for half of it. And in a quite damning indictment of how 3D has gone for the studios, there is a full website called realorfake3d.com. And just looking at it here, this site tells you what films were made specifically for 3D and what films were converted in post-production. Now, at the time of recording, I don't have information on every film that's come out this year. So as of recording in mid-September, the only true 3D film that has been released in cinemas this year, 2019, was Elita Battle Angel. James Cameron had direct involvement on that film. I think that tells you everything. Every other 3D film converted. Last year, only a few foreign films were converted for 3D. Everything else, including Black Panther, Jurassic World Fallen Kingdom, Mortal Engines, Ready Player One, Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse, Tomb Raider and A Wrinkle in Time were converted. 2017, one film was real, Transformers Last Night, and everything else, including Beauty and the Beast, Blade Runner 2049, Ghost in the Shell, which arguably should have been made in true 3D, The, the Great War, Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2, Jumanji Welcome to the Jungle, Kong Skull Island, King Arthur Daily He's Alright, Sorry, Kurt Bode, I had to do it. The Mummy, a film myself and Ed Greenberg hated. Pirates of the Caribbean, Dead Men Tell No to Anger. That's not the UK title. Pirates of the Caribbean, Salazar's Revenge. Yeah, we get the, the crap end of the deal. Star Wars The Last Jedi. Valyrian, a Luke Besson film. Converted, what? War for the Planet of the Apes, Wonder Woman, and Triple X. No, not that kind of Triple X. The Return of Xander Cage. All of those were converted. And only a few of them were able to make their money back. And the ones that were able to make their money back, Beauty and the Beast, Guardians of the Galaxy 2, Jumanji, and Star so, so Wars The Last Jedi, War for the Planet of the Apes, Wonder Woman. The rest of them were for lops. This is a genuinely interesting site, and if you want to know what works in 3D and what doesn't, this site should be your go-to. Because it is just... Some of, some, of the, some of the films on the converted list are genuinely shocking. You would have thought that they were made specifically for the format, but nope. They're converted, using computers, and nine times out of ten they don't look as good. The industry has since moved on from 3D, instead opting to focus on bigger screens, reclining seats, premium retail offerings, and a variety of other technologies, including 4K, which I know incredibly well, HDR, which is the new Dolby standard, and they've also doubled down on the installations of immersive sound techniques like Dolby Atmos, which is object-based. If you thought 5.1 was loud, if you thought 7.1 was louder, just think of that, but with speakers on the roof. It's, it's that crazy. Filmmakers are abandoning 3D because it's just too expensive and the box office revenues have declined year on year. Die-hard fans of the format are just banking on James Cameron being able to deliver the goods once again with Avatar 2, whenever it comes out. We're recording this journal way in advance. But Avatar changed and arguably killed the 3D industry in one go. Because, let's be real, can you even top that? So yes, there's a lot to go into with 3D and we could easily make another episode on it. In fact, I could easily do episodes on simplifying how cinema technology works, just so you guys got more standing to educate and inform yourselves. I mean, because we've got a whole episode on cinema etiquette and works. Uh, these, this journal is sort of not just sort of, not just about the film, it's all about making sure that you guys know how this industry works and making it in an understandable way for you guys to go in and say, look, I have issues with this film, it's not been shown right, your sound's not working. In fact, we might do an episode on Dolby Atmos. Breaking it, breaking down cinema technologies in a short and concise manner 
for the person who isn't into the world of big screen entertainment. So that is it for this month's journal. Uh, hell of a lot of work and research went into this one. A lot of voiceovers too. Uh, I am now going to go and watch some more rugby. Uh, but while I am watching England potentially get trounced in Rugby World Cup because we're England, we always, we always get demolished in national rugby tournaments. Just got to look at the fact we got knocked down in 2015 in our, while we were hosting it. But while I am watching a rugby, you know what to do next. Like, share, subscribe. Uh, head over to leejacksmith.com for all the latest reviews, news, and all that sort of stuff. Uh, listen to Talking Spit Bet Film, we're back weekly now. Uh, and yeah, that's all I can really say. Until our next episode, we shall see you at the movies. Probably not in 3D, still in 2D, because doing a 3D export of this would be quite pointless. We'll see you next episode, everyone. Ooh, now I get why they don't say to use these at sunglasses. These I've got, so these are branded pair. They are a brand. Right, this is this one's going in the outtake reel. But I don't know how well you can see this, but they are view branded 3D glasses. Completely forgot they uh, they did stuff like that.